Costco is a retailer that has figured out how to get its customers to pay for the privilege of shopping there. And its members decide the privilege is worth the cost, year after year after year. The now global chain of warehouse stores counts more than 55 million members around the world, and around 90% of them renew their memberships each year. If you want a 25 pound bag of beans, a bucket of soy sauce, or a crate full of bananas, Costco is the place to go. While you are there, you can buy a flat screen TV, a pair of eyeglasses, some gourmet cheese, and a few pairs of sweat socks. You might be astonished at how little each item costs, and yet you might end up spending much more than you plan to. Costco developed a retail recipe that might have sounded crazy when the company was founded, charging people a fee to allow them to spend money in the store. But it works, in part because Costco is a company that is run very much for the pleasure of its members, and its members are fiercely loyal. But the question is, how long can it hold on to that? Younger generations of consumers have grown up shopping online, and companies such as Amazon have taken some of Costco's secrets and applied them to e-commerce, all while making shopping online a matter of clicking a single button. Add that to the downstream effects of the coronavirus. Sales fell in April for the first time in a decade, largely due to lockdowns and safety measures. They bounced back in May, June, and July, but the company meanwhile had to spend $283 million in COVID-related safety and sanitation costs during the third quarter of 2020, which ended in May. Furthermore, Costco wants or even arguably needs shoppers to physically visit its stores. That is a big part of the experience. Long lockdown periods around the country and general anxiety about contracting the coronavirus led many shoppers to stay home and buy more of what they needed online. The company is highly dependent on membership fees for its profits, meaning it needs to keep giving customers reasons to pay a minimum of $60 per year to shop at the store. Costco also raises membership fees every few years. Subscriptions and memberships are often some of the household expenses first to go when budgets tighten, and consumers faced with a wide array of subscription services for gyms, streaming services, meal delivery, and other things may be deciding what they ought to cut if the economy goes into a downturn. Costco's membership numbers held steady and even increased during the recession that began around 2008, but it remains to be seen just how resilient its business is this time around. Costco declined to participate in this story. What is today called Costco actually grew out of a merger of two retailers with similar business models. The first was called Price Club, and it was started in 1976 in a converted airplane hangar in San Diego, California. The store took its name from founder Saul Price, a Bronx-born attorney who, in many ways, pioneered the club warehouse retail model more than two decades before starting Price Club. Price had learned a great deal about the world of business through his legal work, helping clients with bankruptcies, real estate deals, and partnerships. But he had never run a store before. He entered the retail business as a way to find a use for a warehouse he helped his mother-in-law acquire as an investment in 1953. While searching around for a purpose for this property, Price heard about a company called Fedco, a large warehouse store in Los Angeles that sold a variety of goods at very low prices. It was open only to members, run in a manner similar to a cooperative, and had been primarily created to serve U.S. Postal Service workers and their families. After trying unsuccessfully to partner with Fedco in his San Diego warehouse, Price opened FedMart. At FedMart, Price developed the idea of selling goods at very low margins while charging a membership fee. The company became tremendously successful and inspired other large low-price retailers. Sam Walton said many of his ideas for Walmart came from Price's store. FedMart went public in 1959 on the American Stock Exchange. The company was bought by a German retailer in 1975, but the new owners failed to maintain Price's success, and FedMart closed its doors by 1983. Price then founded the Price Company in 1975 and opened Price Club in 1976. 
The chain of stores had much the same model as Price's previous venture. A few years later, two men named Jeff Brotman and Jim Sinegal founded Costco in the Seattle, Washington area in 1983. Like Price, Brotman was a lawyer with commercial ambitions, who ventured into the club warehouse business at the urging of his father, who had noticed Price's success. The other Costco founder, Jim Sinegal, had spent years working closely with Price at both FedMart and Price Club. Costco grew rapidly from nothing to $3 billion in sales in under six years. Price Club and Costco merged in 1993 and were initially named Price Costco. The company became just Costco in 1997. Since that merger, Costco has attained explosive growth. In 1993, the company reported $15.5 billion in sales. In 2019, its sales totaled $152.7 billion. The company went public on December 5th, 1985. Since then, shares have risen more than 19,000% from an IPO price, before stock splits, of $10 per share to $344 per share on August 26th, 2020. A basic Costco membership costs $60 per year. There is also a Gold Star Executive membership that costs twice that. That comes with some special perks, such as 2% cashback rewards up to $1,000 per year, savings on trips booked through Costco Travel, and on a variety of other services Costco provides, such as identity protection, auto and home insurance, and bottled water delivery. The value of these services would vary per customer, but someone who opted out of them and only collected the 2% cashback reward would have to spend $6,000 per year to recoup the $120 executive membership fee. The thing is that Costco doesn't make most of its money from the actual sale of goods. Its margins on the products on its shelves are extremely thin, much thinner than those of grocery stores, for example. Instead, Costco's profits come from its memberships. You know, most of their net income comes from membership uh, fee revenue. So last year, you know, 92% of their net, their total net income came in the form of membership fee revenue. So that membership fee revenue essentially drops straight down to the bottom line because there's basically no cost associated with it. It could be said that the store actually exists for the purpose of getting its members to renew their memberships year after year after year. And so, Costco is extremely focused on keeping its members happy. In fact, the company has been known to refuse to raise prices on goods in order to improve margins on sales, just to keep its customers coming in the door. It is also known for treating its workers well. Costco store employees make better wages than those at many other retailers. The company justifies the better pay and benefits for workers on the grounds that happier employees will be more helpful to members and improve the shopping experience. In this world of, you know, what is what is stakeholder capitalism versus shareholder capitalism, I think Costco's already they had the right approach to use it. Look, at, you, you care about your associates and you care about your customers, because if your associates aren't happy and working hard uh, and, and excited to be where they are, then your customers are going to see that, your members and service levels they get. And so the virtuous circle and the best thing for shareholders is ultimately to have happy customers. And the way you get happy customers is to have generally happy employees. Uh, so uh, to me, they've sort of gotten it the right way. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, it is shareholder capitalism, but the best way to, to, benefit, to benefit shareholders longer term is to take care of your customers. And a key way to do that is to take care of your associates. Costco also offers some perks to all members that are designed to make the experience of shopping more pleasant and easy. The store is famous for having various stations set up throughout, handing out free samples of different products, often food. Costco had to briefly shut down this practice during the coronavirus pandemic, no doubt disappointing many members. In addition to free samples, there are also frequently in-store demos of other products, such as electronics. Costco also offers a concierge service for members, essentially a technical support line where people can call for help with products purchased in the store. 
While some members might be relieved to discover they are able to get help with products once they have bought them, part of what Costco offers is extremely careful attention to what it even chooses to stock in its stores in the first place. Many customers might not notice as they stroll past the pallets of sodas, stacks of egg crates, and towers of paper towels that despite the appearance of a vast warehouse stuffed with goods, inventory is tightly controlled. Items are packaged in large quantities, but there is a relatively small number of products, often called stock keeping units or SKUs, for the unique barcode attached to any unique item. A single Costco carries only about 4,000 SKUs, whereas a Walmart Supercenter can carry nearly 150,000. But those products are very carefully chosen. In many ways, Costco was a pioneer in the now common practice of collecting and analyzing customer data. When a member makes a purchase at Costco, the first thing they do is swipe their Costco card. Evercore ISI estimates that Costco has a team of more than 100 buyers. Those buyers can access shopping data when determining what sorts of products they ought to fill a store's shelves with. Those buyers are able to use that information to really seek out uh, items that their members uh, might might really appreciate that you wouldn't wouldn't be obvious. Uh, but that could be anything from you know leather coats, uh, unique jewelry items, a newly uh, packaged uh, way or innovative way to put together a camera and the lenses. Uh, that maybe isn't sold anywhere else. So really finding what it is that their members might like, and that's what creates the treasure hunt. The company uses its massive number of members as leverage when negotiating with suppliers. Though Costco's prices are typically low, getting the absolute lowest price in a category is not always the point. The point, say analysts who follow the company, is delivering good value. Products also rotate in and out of the store's inventory. There's a pretty good chance that many of the items a shopper sees on Costco shelves might not be there in a month or two. The rotating stock encourages impulse buying. Each visit to the store can yield a surprise for a member, maybe a blender or a pair of running shoes. Seeing something unexpected and knowing it might not be there in the future can lead shoppers to jump at the opportunity to make an unplanned purchase. The store has also found other ways beyond the shelves to keep people coming back, including cheap gasoline, optical services, and low-cost medical devices, such as hearing aids. There's a travel service, a credit card, and a car buying service. The big, the big picture is once you have, in the US, we, we think they have over uh, well over 30 million households that are signed up as Costco members. You're trying to find a way to add value to those members outside of the club, outside of those four enclosed walls. And I think ancillary businesses are a way to take the power of the membership outside the club. Uh, so for example, travel, uh, they can get package, package discounts on everything from hotels uh, to cruises. Uh, but that's been a, a, one area of value add. One another one's car buying. So sort of, sort of cutting out the middleman and saying, hey, we will, we will bring our group of members to a pre-negotiated price so that none of, none of us have to go through the hassle of the whole haggle with the dealer. The credit card's another one where uh, there's a, a cash back program uh, where you can get 4% back on gasoline, 3% on restaurant spend, on travel spend, even takeout or curbside pickup restaurant spend, I've noticed uh, during this year of COVID. So uh, that's a pretty good value to the member on top of the normal uh, extra 2% or 1% you might get uh, elsewhere at a Costco. And there is, of course, the food court that sells $1.50 hot dogs and other low-priced fare. Its efforts to provide value to its members have also led to the creation of its own house brand, Kirkland Signature, which has become a considerable and growing portion of its business. The sheer range of products is astonishing. There are Kirkland diapers and Kirkland bottled waters, of course, but there are also Kirkland wines and liquors. Importantly, Kirkland products are not simply cheaper versions of name brand goods. When Costco brings the Kirkland line into a category, the company takes care to ensure the product it's selling is high quality and sometimes unique. The retailer is not just trying to sell something cheaper, it's trying to add unique value, inspiring brand loyalty. Some members report that they prefer Kirkland paper towels to those offered by other brands, for example. Kirkland Signature products accounted for roughly 30% of Costco sales in 2019. 
The Kirkland Signature brand is arguably what has helped the company fend off competition from other clubs, such as Walmart's Sam's Club, other bricks and mortar retailers, and the ever-growing world of e-commerce, where all kinds of items can be ordered cheaply and in all kinds of quantities and often delivered right to a customer's door. One much talked about segment is Kirkland's wines and liquors, which have gained a reputation for being cheap and, at least to some buyers, tastier than more high-end brands. Rumors have even circulated that Kirkland's liquors are just rebottled brand name liquors, such as Grey Goose for vodka and McAllen for whiskey. Grey Goose's makers have denied this in the past, and Costco has refused to comment. The rumor might in part depend on the fact that Kirkland Vodka sources water from the same region in France Grey Goose draws from, and some taste testers have given Costco's French vodka higher scores than Grey Goose. That said, the company does face some threats. Its e-commerce presence is growing, but it lags behind others. One very obvious threat comes from another Washington-based company that has probably done more to upset retail in America and around the world than any other, Amazon. Jeff Bezos' mostly online empire has taken pages right out of Costco's playbook. You don't need a membership to shop on Amazon, but having one does come with perks, such as fast shipping on many purchases, as well as access to other services, like online video and music. Through services like it, consumers have become accustomed to the lightning fast and seamless experience of one-click buying. If there is a place where Costco lags, it is in e-commerce. There are often minimum order requirements, and products can be more expensive online than they are in the club. But the way that they keep costs in line to make sure they keep that promise that, that I'm not paying more for my paper towels because you want yours delivered, that they do have minimum order thresholds. Two-day delivery, $75. They do charge more for products that are sold either through Instacart or um, on their two-day delivery. So, you know, they're they're addressing e-commerce, think, in a very Costco kind of manner. Uh, they're not going at it just to get more e-commerce sales, but they're doing it to, to take care of their members. In fact, Costco wants customers to go to the store. The store is where Costco shines, and members locate those unexpected finds that fill their carts and help drive up sales. That may be a problem for them in the long term. Analysts who follow the company say e-commerce sales are growing, if slowly, and Costco is, if also slowly, beefing up its online presence. Like all, all hypermarkets and, and super centers such as Walmart, Target, a lot of their competitors, they've, they've had a huge surge in e-commerce sales from, from COVID-19. If you look, their e-commerce sales year to date through July were up about 45%. And in more recent months, like June and July, um, their their growth rates have been much higher than that. So, you know, they've really benefited from this shift. In March 2020, Costco acquired a transportation company called Innovel Solutions that specializes in last mile delivery, especially for larger goods like major appliances, furniture, mattresses, television, grills, patio, fitness equipment, and wine cellars. But the retailer is also calibrating its in-store inventory to suit changing tastes, say investors. Younger shoppers may be willing to pony up the $60 minimum membership fee if they find goods on Costco shelves which they cannot find anywhere else, even on the largest online marketplaces. From our survey work, uh, we think the, the median or typical Costco member in the US is around, is approaching 50 years old uh, for head of household. And I think ideally you'd want that to be more like 40. Uh, 45, you usually want your demographics to be younger because you need to have that customer for longer. So just things they've done over the years to, to really move and get the millennials to, to join uh, have been adding organics uh, in a pretty major way, you know, emphasizing sustainability in more areas. There is also the question of subscription fatigue. Customers often have many more subscriptions today than in the past for streaming services, fitness centers, news outlets, and in some cases, even cars. There are worries that customers will cut some of these out of budgets when they become overwhelmed or when economic times are tight. But Costco memberships may prove more resilient than other such services. We think subscription fatigue is a, is a real thing, but we don't really see it for, for Costco because they sell essentials. I mean, this is a, a retailer of, of consumer staples. So, you know, they're more defensive play. Uh, therefore, we think, um, you know, their renewal rates will stay very high uh, through the pandemic. Now, we don't see them raising their subscription fees 
uh, for the foreseeable future. But you know, we think Costco has a has a place as kind of an essential a subscription for families. There is evidence that Costco's model might be rather resilient and quite exportable. Costco has expanded into countries around the world, and in many markets, it has proven a hit. You know, this is a company who, you know, 87% of their stores are located in North America. 70% of their total stores are located in the U.S. Costco is having a, a huge growth opportunity internationally, uh, especially in China. But they've really done a good job growing out their North American store base over the last three decades or so. In fact, analysts say Costco is more profitable outside the U.S. than inside of it. Part of that just might be domestic competition. In some countries, Costco is the only club retailer around. It even works in some unlikely markets. It's funny, I'll admit I was I was wrong. When they first went in Japan and I, and I wanted to see it 15 years ago, I'm like, this is not gonna work. Selling large package cube bulk items in a place where the average household is uh, is less than half the size of an American home uh, just doesn't make sense. But what, you, what I think they found there, and I think they're up close to now 50 clubs uh, are on their path to be there is People like shocking value and quality. And even in Japan, uh, they've been able to, to develop some really highly productive stores with a very strong membership model, including a, a magazine that's in print um, that, that's, that's very popular uh, about the Costco lifestyle. When a Costco opened in Shanghai, China, where there is no shortage of competition online and offline in retail, shoppers mobbed the store. On its first day open, Costco had to cap the number of customers allowed inside. A number of international grocery chains and other retailers have struggled in China. But Costco's opening day in China produced traffic jams, reported three-hour waits for parking spaces, and even scenes of customers tussling over cuts at the meat counter. If that kind of enthusiasm persists, Costco may soon find it has created a whole new crop of fanatical members, this time in the world's most populous country.